bring her for you tonight. Enjoy. Hi, good evening. Good evening, thank you for joining us. Okay, um, I guess ever since she sentenced um, the US um, gymnastics team doctor, Larry Nasser, um, Judge Rosemary Aquilina dominated headlines in several parts of the world, especially in the United States. Um, she's emerged as a symbol uh, for survivors of sexual abuse, especially. You could say she's a listener in chief, um, who voices both outrage and the need for change. Of course, um, her outspokenness is quite unusual for a sitting judge, especially in a place like Malta. We're not, we're not used to a judge speaking out. Um, her father's a doctor from Rendi. Her mother's German, and she proudly wears her heritage on her sleeve. <laughs> um, I've never had the chance to interview a judge, uh, because judges here and several other countries basically cannot speak to the media. Is it because you're unconventional, or is it that most judges are untouchables? In the United States, we're not allowed to talk about an ongoing case that's in front of us. But once a case is closed, or for example, if I have an issue that is in front of me where I think there needs to be legislation, I'm allowed to talk. I talk to the media, I talk to legislators. I have walked over to the Capitol and said, we need this change, let's change the law. And then when the bill comes up, I testify, and usually it passes because the, the legislature needs to know from judges what we see and how we can make the laws better. So we're allowed to talk, but there are limitations. Yeah, I mean, obviously your punchy language led some critics to say you, know, you crossed the line of impartiality. And I can understand where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to them? Well, first and foremost, I want you to know if you look at America, just Google different judges and states and answer the question for me. If I was a man and used the same language and did exactly what I did, would I have received that kind of backlash? I think in part it's because I'm a woman. And they're not used to, even in America, women speaking out using strong language. You have to understand for Larry Nasser, he was the largest predator we had had. One in front of me, I allowed 169 to speak. 156 of those he had assaulted. Now, I want you to think about this. He pled to seven counts, seven counts that were life offenses. There were 26 indictments against him, so 19 of those went away by him pleading, and they found child pornography on his phone, and because of the plea, they didn't charge that. Now I want you to think about this. Just one of his victims, Trinae Gonzer, and this is documented. He assaulted since she was about six years old, and there's evidence of the appointments she had with him in the meetings. He assaulted just that one victim 849 times. To date in America, about 505 have come forward. I think the numbers may be three to 5,000 because we know that only a small percentage of rape victims, people who suffer domestic violence, trafficking, all of those, that whole arena, only a very small portion come forward. So I think in his case, there's many women who have not come forward and I in fact know that because many have contacted me and said, me too, by Larry Nasser, but I'm okay. I don't want to come forward. I just wanted to tell you. If Larry Nasser showed some remorse, would you have pushed on the sentence? He actually did show remorse for himself that he got caught. <laughs> um, no, I would not have. And here's why. His deal was, uh, we have what we call the minimum sentence and then the maximum sentence. So if it's, a, for example, a home invasion, it's a 20-year felony, and 
the, max, the maximum you can spend is 20 years, and then the minimum is set by certain uh, criteria. So I could send someone to no prison, to jail, which would be a year, or up to two-thirds of that 20 years. In his case, the minimum, because it was life, I got to set that. But the plea deal said that the minimum would be between, and this was his agreement with the, the prosecutor and defense counsel, right? 25 to 40 years. So the most I could do on the minimum was 40 years, but I got to set the maximum. So I did a little math. First of all, he's 54 years old. Second, he pled to life offenses. Generally, life starts at 25 years. He got the deal of a lifetime. If you divide seven counts that he pled to into 40, it's what, about three and a half years per assault. That is less than a drunk driving third. And I set the 175 because there were seven counts. I did seven times 25, 175 math. Even for a lawyer, for a simple judge, that was easy math for me. There was no possibility of him being rehabilitated. He still calls himself a good doctor. He still says it's treatment. He says what he did. Maybe it was malpractice, but not criminal. That is someone who will not own what he did. He cannot be rehabilitated. I have many offenders who can be rehabilitated. And when I can save a life, when I can retrain a life, I do. But in his case, he is a predator. He wants power and control. If you watch the trial, he tried to get power and control of my courtroom. I didn't have any of it. He was mad that he got three female judges, a female prosecutor, and a female detective who he could not control. And he got the deal of a lifetime at 40 years. I don't think, even if I'm reversed, that any judge would do less than 40 years. You said you, we, we had an interview with the, with the Sunday Times last week, and, and, and uh, Judge Aquino said she actually remains in touch with both the perpetrators and, and the victims. Um, have you been in touch with Nasser at all since you signed his death warrant? No, with Nasser, no. I am often, um, and I think that some reporters have tried to talk to him, and he's declined. But for defendants, you know, many defendants, in fact, most defendants get out of jail and prison. They all get out of jail, but most get out of prison. They don't wear a scarlet letter. We don't know who they are. So I try to rehabilitate them. Sometimes I do have to send them to prison, but I always do what you saw me do with the girls. And that is to tell them that they can do better, that they are worthy, that they can not let this, whatever crimes they did, do not let that define your life. Come back and show me the great things you've done. And many of those defendants are so grateful. They come back and they show me their healthy babies. They show me their paychecks. They show me their music contracts, their art. And they tell me, I'm back. I wanted to show you. I did this because of you. And I ultimately say, no, you did it because you decided you were worthy and, and you could do something. And look what you've done, and it's great. And they say, you were the first person to tell me that I was worthy, that I was worth something, that I mattered. They had no one in their life until this mean judge in a black robe says, you matter, you can do better. Not everybody has a mommy and daddy like most of us had. And so I try to, on both sides, tell everybody they can do better. For the victims to leave their pain in my courtroom, they matter, they did nothing wrong. For the defendants, you can be rehabilitated, you matter, and you are worthy. And they come back, both sides, and tell me that because I used that power that I have, they believed me. They didn't believe their sister, their brother, their wife, their husband. But because of this big room, this courtroom, and this black robe, and this gavel, and they see the power, they felt it. They felt that I thought they mattered, and they wanted to do better. And I think that's really an important job of judges, that we are not punishers. 
that we recognize that everyone in front of us is human, worthy, and can be rehabilitated. And I have to say, people ask me in America, how can you do that? Why do you do that? And I do tell them, it's my Maltese roots. Because in Malta, people matter. It's, it's about family, and I think we're all connected, and that's the way I was raised. So I try to treat everybody in front of me as their family. But again, um, your role as a judge, shouldn't the correctional element of a case be down to uh, maybe a therapist, uh, correctional facilities? Mm -hmm. I mean, you spoke about your Maltese roots. I, I've been to court and seen both uh, the perpetrators and, and uh, the victims walk out even more terrified uh, after they face a judge. Yes, and, and that's a disgrace to the judicial system. The judicial system is broken when that happens. I think that I'm not a therapist. I'm, I make it clear I'm not a therapist. But I am also very aware that when you treat people right, they want to do better. Even the defendants, they want to do better. If you treat them poorly, those are the ones who get out of jail or prison and they do worse things to us. And they don't have a scarlet letter. We don't know if they're behind us in the movie theater or the grocery store or they're with our children. So I try to treat everybody humanely. Now, Larry Nasser, he doesn't get it, and he's a danger. But I try to rehabilitate when I can, and I do think it's a judge's role to tell people that, yes, you've done something wrong, but you matter, and you can do better. Why do we want an angry society? Let it start with the judges. We can punish, but we can do it with a hand that says, you still matter. The case, the Nasser case, came probably in the middle of the Me Too movement mm -hmm. here, and it was probably one of the most cathartic moments of, of, of that movement. But again, on the other side, on the flip side, you were criticized, as we were saying before, being too emotive, you know, the fact that you're a woman, you were somebody, I said, uh, I remember reading you were too gleeful in, uh, in sentencing a man who is now considered to be a monster. Were there, was, were there any times uh, during, the, during the trial, uh, and especially in the aftermath, when you said, maybe you thought you had adopted too much the role of a uh, victim advocate? No. Here's the thing. Was that an emotional case? Yes. Was I ever gleeful? No. Was it terribly traumatic and painful to listen? Yes. But in sentencing him, in listening to his actions, in watching him sometimes not face the victims, to laugh with his attorneys, to not pay attention, to be drawing while they're talking, it really frustrated and irritated me. And you could feel the pain in the courtroom going up. And when I put him in his place, the pain went down and people were relieved. And the thing about judges in America, at least in Michigan, we are elected. In some states, it's appointed. But we are elected. And I am allowed from the bench to be the voice of those who elect me. And I assure you, there was no one in my courtroom or in my community who wanted me to hand him roses and say, there, there, it's okay. So I'm the voice of the people. And again, I have to say to those people, if I was a man, would I have been criticized that I was gleeful? I was not gleeful. But I wanted the girls to have the message that they were safe, that they didn't do anything wrong, that they should have been listened to 30 years ago, that they can leave their pain here, that no one should ever shut them down or shut them out. You think about this, if one would have been listened to 30 years ago, this case never would have been mine. It never should have been mine. Why wouldn't you believe a child? How does a child know about sexual acts unless it's happened? As a female judge, do you look at things differently to a male judge? I've never been a man, so I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> but I can tell you, I think that women have a little bit more patience. I can tell you my male colleagues are and some of the emails and comments that I've heard from male judges is, how dare you? You should be off the bench. 
Those are the judges that sleep with their secretaries that pinch people's rear ends. And also that leave after a few hours of doing work and you can find them in the bagel shop or the golf course. I assure you that I am there working and that I spend extra time on every case because the only thing in front of me is that case. I don't know how many of you have been in touch with the legal system. It's a long process but you deserve your day in court. And when you are in front of the judge, that is the most important thing that is happening in your life, and I will give you the time and the voice. And I think every judge should. And I think that women are particularly in tune with that, but I've also seen female judges who dismiss people. So I think it's really not one of gender, but one of who you are, how you're raised, and uh, the gender does play into it, sadly, but um, for me, it's really just about people. And for me, again, that's why I raised in the sentencing that I'm Maltese, because I think that going to my family roots, it's all about treating people humanely and giving them a voice. And in Malta, don't we talk loud? <laughs> See, my American friends don't understand it, but I will talk until I am heard, and I will fight until I have the answer. I do not take no. I change no's into yes, and I want that for my children, and that's what my grandparents taught me, and that's what I pass on. In fact, on that point, um, one of the comments on the Times of Malta last Sunday by a man was when he was referring to your quote where, where Judge Aquilina said, I stand tall, I'm tough, and I use my voice. And his comment was, this is the chest-beating braggadocio of the bully, not the voice of the impartial judge. Mm -hmm. So there you go. But However, let me just say, if he was in front of me and I let him speak, his tune would change. Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, of course, Post NASA, there was this discussion that even the US, that the Me Too movement had gone too far. That the, the fact that every male became a predator, even if the hair was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, consent from the woman. And this is something we keep hearing today. And yes, there is a legitimate argument to be made, at least me as a man. I mean, you know, I, God forbid if I'm ever accused of, you know, for, for, uh, with wrongdoing when, when the act is consensual. I mean, has it done the opposite of what you intended, of, of turning innocent people into fearing for their lives. I don't think so. The numbers do not uh, show that. In fact, the numbers, because it's being studied, the numbers show that false reporting on sexual assault is the same level of any other false reported crime. So it has not done that. And Yes, Me Too and Time's Up have come to me and have said, you moved us faster and farther than anything we could have done. That wasn't my intent. I did what I do every single day. I am really happy that it has had this effect. But as I go around the country, I think it's important that we understand as people that this Me Too and Time's Up movement is not a woman's movement. It is a people's movement. There are men who are assaulted, who are afraid to speak up, who are not treated equally. And so this is a conversation that men and women need to have together. This is a conversation we need to have with our children about body parts, about acceptable touches, about actually asking permission to hug. My daughter does not let my grandchildren sit on Santa Claus's lap. And the reason is because she does not want to give or have it seem to her children that she's giving them permission to sit on a strange man's lap. It really is about the communication. It's about the dialogue. It's about teaching our children from the time they are able to speak. The names of body parts, the fact that they have the right to speak up and speak out, to be heard, and to say no. And this would go equally to men and women. I understand that's a fear. I have two sons. I don't want either one of them ever accused. But we need to have the dialogue equal between men and women and have men be part of the equation. So this movement, I think, gives women a bad name because it's seen as we're out to get men. 
In fact, we want to be equal, we want to be equally heard, and I listen to men exactly the same. Men have a different burden than women, because you're men. It is not seen as if you are strong if you speak out that you've been hurt. And we need to change that. We need to change that, that thinking of man up. You know, it, that's a bullying term. When you tell someone to man up, that's bullying. It tells them to shut up and shut down. Man up needs to be that a man speaks for himself, that he speaks for his wife, for his daughter, for others. And then we're going to have true equality. Do you identify yourself as a feminist? I identify myself as a loud Maltese mom. <laughs> Um, just to make it clear, I'm, I'm asking questions and all that. I, I hate the sound of my voice sometimes and all that. So I will bring uh, some of you in, into, into it very shortly. Um, but maybe I can draw it home to Malta now. Um, I'd, I'd like to raise one particular case which has shocked a lot of people. Um, there was a man who was charged with indecent assault in 2011. I, I need to be careful to make sure I have the right wording here. He was under the influence of alcohol. He stopped a woman in the middle of the road, it was a main road, close to here, hit her several times on the head, removed her trousers, and uh, he was struggling to remove her underwear when she finally succeeded in breaking free. Motorists um, took note of the number plate, arrested. Several years later, this was last September, a court of appeal found him not guilty of attempted rape, as there was not enough evidence of the intention to rape the victim. Um, it's not over yet. The court took into consideration he had a relatively clean criminal record and uh, he got away, I believe, with a suspended sentence. Um, you would say you can't pass judgment on, on this judgment, but surely there must have been some form of punishment. There is a thing in the law that says the thing speaks for itself. And in this type of crime, what else was the intent if you beat someone over the head and take their underwear off? There has to be some common sense. I, it's hard for me to comment on any case that I haven't read that I wasn't there for. But it's really not justice when several years later a case comes before a court because memories fade. And then, so now we have this defendant who allegedly has done nothing else. Maybe others have simply not come forward. I think the goal needs to be to rehabilitate him, even if it's felt that he's not done anything wrong in the last several years, maybe he hasn't. But let's be sure and let's rehabilitate him. And that's what I probably would have done in a case like this, is to put him into cognitive therapy to let him look at the errors of his ways and to learn to make better choices. Make sure he has substance abuse treatment so that he can't use alcohol as an excuse because alcohol is not an excuse to violate the law. I would put him in sex offender treatment to make sure that whatever issues he had were addressed. And then if he did not do those things, I would incarcerate him for a while and have those classes be done in jail or prison and then release him because we need to have public assurance that we are all safe. It is not good enough that he treated himself. Dr. Nasser treated himself too. He's still a good doctor, he says. Do any of you, would any of you like to go see him? No. We need to make sure that the public has safety, security, that we can sleep at night, and that we know the law, the law works for us. It's not good enough to just say he was he was a good person for a little while, so we're going to forgive a heinous crime. Let's at least treat it. Magistrates and judges in Malta are appointed by the government. Mm -hmm. um, and a good number of them, and this has been the trend for a good number of years now, are, have actually been somewhat linked to a political party. <coughs> Does that pose a problem? Do you think it could impinge on their independence? I find it interesting that judges cannot speak yet to the media and about cases. However, they're appointed by a political party. Doesn't that speak? That shows a lack of impartiality. I am not a Republican. I am not a Democrat. I am independent. I am nonpartisan. 
And the reason for that is because if you came in front of me and I ruled against you and we were of different parties, you could easily say, she only ruled on me because we're different parties. She never looked at the evidence. That shows bias and lack of impartiality. Texas is a state in the United States where the judges are not appointed, they're elected, but they run on party uh, tickets, Democrat and Republican. And there's a movement in Texas by the judges to run nonpartisan because they do feel that they have that stigma of bias. And I've done some training with them. And they're very interested in how Michigan does things because being uh, not affiliated really goes to that fair and impartial, impartial decision making that we're supposed to have. It, it gets rid of the appearance of impropriety. So I do not believe that uh, the governor or uh, whoever is in charge of, of the state, the prime minister, should appoint. I think that it should be elected by the people. You should be standing in front of judges you elected. We are your voice. It's your courtroom. Case. Have you considered getting into politics? Mm -hmm. I've been asked to run for just about everything, including president, and I keep reminding people, <laughs> I keep reminding people I was not born on American soil. Um, Would you be a politician in Malta then? Uh, well, <laughs> wouldn't that be fun? Um, maybe that will retire into that. Um, I have a, I worked for a state senator for 10 years, and I love politics. Uh, I think it's really the best game in town. But I think that right now where I'm supposed to be, uh, being a judge, I have offers to do all sorts of things. I'd like to make a difference doing what I'm doing now, and then I will look at the future, whether it's to go for higher public office uh, as a judge or uh, elected as a Democrat. Um, or I don't know what I'm going to do. I just know that God gave me this case. This was not a case that was handed to me. It's by random draw. The computer gave it to me. And when people say, how did you get this case? Or many of the other high profile cases or terrible cases I've had. I always say when God wants a laugh, he, he gives it to me. <laughs> but in this particular case, I really feel that because there was such an outpouring around the world, that there's a greater mission here, that the mission is to keep the conversation going for change for all of our children. And when I die, which I hope is not until I'm 120, I'm bartering with God. Um, when I die, I hope that what I can look back at is not necessarily my life, but the changes that I have made so that I can go to, to God knowing that my children and your children are safer. And I think that is the goal that I'm focusing on right now. Would you consider becoming a full-time author? Ultimately, you are the author of two books. <laughs> I love writing. I always wanted to be an author. And when I told my father, when he said, what are you going to do in college? I said, I'm going to go to English and be a writer and an author. And he looked at me because that's kind of like saying I'm going to Hollywood to be uh, an actress. And he said, no, you need to be a doctor. You need to be something that you can support yourself in. And so I looked at him and said, fine, I'll be a lawyer because doctors hate lawyers. <laughs> Um, and so, and it has served me well because every case is a story and I was able to learn a lot about the world and now I have something to write about. Would I like to retire writing? Absolutely, I will retire writing. But right now, I write every day and I can still, I, I teach at two law schools, I have children at home, my parents live with me, uh, I have a cooking column. I love to write novels, I'm a judge, I do all sorts of things, and I love the stimulus I get from everything, and it gives me a lot to write about. So, I'll retire into writing, but not now. Would you be retiring here in Malta? I hope someday to maybe have a place in Malta, but at your prices, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have to sell a lot more books. <laughs> Okay, what, I mean, you've been to Malta just a few, couple of times in, in your lifetime. I mean, what have you, you know, talk about your Maltese heritage. You even made the point, mentioned it in, when you yes. were giving uh, Nasser his, his, his death sentence, life sentence. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, well, and I mentioned that because I wanted people to know that I value people. I think the Maltese value life. 
and I valued his life. He just needs to spend his life behind bars. <laughs> okay, we just have to say, these are what makes you Maltese. What are they? Beyond I heard you, you like Minestra and you like... Uh... <laughs> I, so when I was young, while my father was studying uh, to be a doctor in Germany, we emigrated, my brother and I, and my mother to Ma uh, Detroit, where my grandparents had just emigrated. And so I was really raised by, in the formative years, by my grandparents. And so I learned to cook and eat and think Maltese. And so when I need to get back to my roots, that's what I do. I cook minestra and pastizzi, and yes, I make the dough from scratch, and yes, I make the ricotta from scratch. And my friends don't understand it, but to me, the cooking is being here, is being with my family. It's the memories of the people who were closest to me, but also the, Mal the Maltese values. Family. My parents live with me because they'll never go to the nursing home. And maybe that's lost in this generation here, I don't know. But we, in, in the, the Malta that I know, the family that I was raised in, we take care of each other. I'm the oldest child, it's my responsibility. I pass that on to my children. Honor, country, family, hard work. I always say Aquilina stands, it means small eagle, but stands for hard work. Um, <coughs> And I think those, those values, my grandmother always said, you work with hands and feet and teeth. And that is what I have found. And I have found in the Maltese sayings that I have learned so much comfort, but also strength. And so this little island has given me the strength to make history three times in the United States without even trying, just by having the Maltese work ethic. And I hold that close, and I am always mindful that that's where it came from. Thank you. We, we can open the floor if there's anybody who would like to ask any question. Uh, we'd be more than happy. Yeah? Do you speak Maltese? Can you speak to us in Maltese? <laughs> well, Sorry. you know, I wish I could, but the, the common language in my home was English. So I understand some German because my mother is German and my father talks German um, went to medical school there. Um, my grandparents always talked Maltese and I understand that. My dad talks with his family still Maltese. So I understand some, I understand a lot of swear words. Um, I always wanted a dog named Imshi because I understood that. <laughs> that the Americans wouldn't understand the joke, but I think it's a great name for a dog, and what do we say, you know? So, <laughs> and I have, yes, I have taught my, my children, Pitsy Pitsy Kamla, right? Kamla Kamla, I, and so I, I don't know all the language, I understand more than I speak, but it's a language I wish I knew, um, and I think it's a beautiful language from beautiful people. Yeah. Um, I have mentioned earlier that uh, judges locally are appointed by the government, and I think that is, it has many problems, but they don't have to worry about getting elected at the end of their term. Do you think <coughs> there might be a, a possible, not conflict of interest, but something that, that, that you would need to be concerned about when you are, uh, not necessarily yourself, obviously, but more to you got to the system. And uh, a second concern that I have is, um, now I, I need to be very clear, I do not in any way uh, empathize with the likes of Larry Nasser or whoever else uh, that is like-minded to him. Uh, but there, were, there are many stories, and I think the, the most famous American one is the Center for Five, but we had a similar one locally too, um, where a guy was, incorrectly accused by his daughter and, um, I don't know how far the, the accusation mm -hmm. went. Yeah, there, the was, there was a case, yes, yes, where his former wife yes. uh, accused him of abusing his child. Yes. And the wife actually encouraged the child to accuse the wife. And it was a separation case, it was really ugly. And <coughs> it's, it's, it's just crazy just even thinking about it. Yes, we have those cases too. We draw the line and we say, you know, 
in the in, in cases where um, it's not black or white. Mm -hmm. In cases where it's not black or white, the you jury will... An enormous responsibility. It, absolutely. First of all, a jury will find, and often on these cases, when it's not black and white, they find not guilty. When people plead in front of me, sometimes I don't accept it because I know they're pleading just to get it behind them, but that's just the terrible life they're creating for themselves. We have what's called incredible testimony. Incredible testimony is really what you're talking about, and... Um, when you hear t incredible testimony, and you can talk to the lawyers who are in front of me all the time, I do not accept every case. When I hear incredible testimony, when I see the evidence has been tainted, or a child does, does not, uh, is recanting something they were told, not what they know, and that becomes tainted evidence, and we have rules about that. I cannot, I don't allow that testimony. There are very strict rules about how you can question a child. And there needs to be a whole lot more education about how all of that works. Are there mistakes made? Yes. Was Larry Nassar a mistake? Hell no! How can hundreds of girls be wrong the same story? And they didn't recant identical stories. There were different things that happened. But ultimately, the bottom line of how it happened and what happened and how he groomed them to believe it was medical treatment and groomed the parents and groomed law enforcement to believe what he was doing was treatment. It, it's unconscionable, and it is. It's a, it's a difficult responsibility, but again, this is one of the reasons that not just in the Larry Nassar case, but in every single case in front of me, I listen to both sides, and I listen to everybody. Because sometimes, for example, I had a woman who was accused of assault with intent to do great bodily harm, less than murder is what she pled to, but what she was really doing is defending herself against her boyfriend who was attacking her. But there was like a cool down period, and so she, uh, she ended up getting arrested and charged. And really, he should have been charged. So what I did with her is I did not put her into prison, and they wanted me to, but I put her into treatment because she was a domestic violence survivor. There has to be some sense. Now, did he suffer? Sure. And she will learn now how to dial 911 instead of doing that, but she has post-traumatic stress syndrome and all sorts of other things. You have to look at each case on its own merits. I don't have an answer for every single one. But it is a difficult job and that is a reason I give voice to everyone. It helps me make better decisions. And as to your earlier question about running for election, I, I, once you are a seated judge, unless you do the wrong things, you generally get reelected. Judges who do the wrong things, they get thrown out. They, another judge, will be elected. I'm up next year. I don't think I'll have an opponent. I was, um, this is my second term as a circuit judge. I was a district judge before that. I ran unopposed last time as well. Uh, the lawyers tend to like me, both sides, because I do listen. And the, even the defendants know that I give them a chance, that I'm willing to make a decision and be appealed by the Court of Appeals. I'm not afraid of appeal. Go ahead and appeal me. In fact, the lawyers that I train, I tell them a judge is, is only a lawyer in a robe. If they take offense at appeal, who cares? The only thing that's important is that you represent your client. Who cares if the judge is mad at you? If they're so mad at you, complain and you'll get another judge. So I think that being elected, being the voice of the people, if you're doing the right things, I have no worries about being unelected. And if somebody kicks me off the bench, I'll go do another job. Lawyers are like weeds. We have jobs everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, as a judge that has really stood her ground, I'm sure you come across many cases where the accused is really going to be accused of something, you know, and you really feel sure that it's going in the right direction and it's going to get the right sentence. 
but then the defending lawyer comes up with technicalities in the law which gets them go scot free. Yes. What do you think about this? Uh, do you intervene in such cases? No, because the justice system works. So sometimes there are cases where we know they're guilty and there's a technicality. I've had to toss cases like that. But here's the thing. A criminal will commit something else and he will eventually be behind bars. And if he was wrongly charged and that's how it got tossed, then he, we will not see him again. The law might seem backwards, but it really is a justice system and it's working, but it is a bit broken and we do need to fix a few things. But I'm never worried about protecting someone's rights and throwing out tainted evidence. If you don't do that, then how can the people have faith in a justice system? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for this. Um, something which troubles me a bit about our local le legislation is the issue of uh, the prescription period or time barring, especially when it comes to child abuse cases. Yes. And some people sort of feel comfortable and can only come to terms with that later in life, by that point then it's too late to actually do anything about it. I was wondering what your, view are, what your views are on this sort of issue. For certain crimes, I think there should be no statute of limitations, and in fact, um, People can say, how, how can you say that? Well, for crimes that are under the domestic violence arena, because whether it's child abuse or sexual abuse, um, spousal abuse, it's, it's all domestic violence. Many times the assaults are so bad that your brain does not even remember them because your brain goes into, and this is scientifically proven, I'm not an expert, but I've heard the experts speak about it. Your brain goes into, I'm going to save myself mode. I want to live. I need to save myself. So your brain does not allow some of the bad parts of the crime to come forward. And then years later, there's a triggering event, and then you remember it. And so we need to get rid of or make the statute of limitations longer or have some kind of exemption for those periods. And hopefully legislatures are looking at that. I know that in America they are looking at that. There's a lot of fights and there has been some movement to change that because uh, the studies now, we know so much more about the brain and, and how it protects itself and those triggers. So I'm hoping that <coughs> Once America does it, everybody does it. So keep, keep pushing for that. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to say this properly, but it's not really a question, it's more of a thank you. Um, in that I was watching the videos on YouTube of the case going on, and um, I think what was most striking and part majority of why the case was so important and so famous was because you put the focus on the victims that they could tell their story properly and that there wasn't the focus on what the accused or the, the, the man was uh, thinking or was uh, feeling and I think that was so powerful and I wanted to thank you for that um, obviously being an American case it went all over the world and that was but even here in Malta, there were, I, I wanted you to know that there were people watching it um, on YouTube and thinking, ah, something is changing. And it, it was very powerful for me personally and friends of mine, etc. So I just wanted to uh, tell you that, to know that I have the opportunity. Thank you. Giving voice to victims empowers them because when you are a victim you lose your power and you don't feel you're worth anything and they question themselves was it their fault could they have done something wrong could, could they have changed it and it's really important that they know that nothing was their fault and that the fault remains solely with the predator and that's what i try to do and, and i'm thankful that you saw that and thank you very much uh, impossible. Uh, I'd like to tell, it's a sort of a uh, question, but uh, I'm a doctor of psychology and lead the groups uh, in my country for the women uh, uh, after the domestic violence and sexual abuse. And uh, it's interesting your opinion because what I found out it's very uh, maybe extraordinary because uh, in most cases, what's going on? that women have some places to go, psychiatrists, some, uh, well, whatever, just cooking, whatever, but men, 
more, most fragile group, in what case, I'm not defend them. They don't speak up. They don't have the place to speak up, really. It's not the alcoholic just, well, we're ex-alcoholics, we're just a thought these groups, and just drug abuse, whatever. But they need someone, a sort of a center, the same as women has, because really, it, it's, it's all over the world. Mm -hmm. They, uh, as we, starting from there, because if they have the opportunity to speak up, so mm, uh, less uh, crimes will exist. It's just, it, 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 the life will be really different, because we have dumb men who just don't know where to put their energy, and that's the result of the sport. <coughs> and I think that uh, it's just in not, not in Malta states or some other countries, uh, men need centers, just I don't know what, where they can really speak up. It's maybe the way out. Um, and me personally, I'm from Moscow. Yes. Um, well, first of all, it's important, and that's one of the reasons that I'm going around and I've agreed to talk to so many people around the world, and it's to keep the conversation going and that this is not just a woman's issue, it is also a man's issue. And we need to retrain our children and the way we think and the, what we talk about at the kitchen table even, and to give everybody voice and to listen and believe. The easiest Q&A I've ever done here. Everybody wants to ask a question, yeah. Something that leaves me more perplexed about American society, for example, when you listen to Vice President Trump uh, being recorded boasting that he grabs women inappropriately, and then you look at his uh, release and you see women for Trump, and this is something which I really can't reconcile myself: how people can legitimize or even accept such such discourse from someone who supposed supposed to be. Uh, representing all the American people, and this is my, this really bothers me. We have a misogynist for a president. How's that? Right. Yes. So, I think that there's really a division in regard to did Trump uh, assault women or not, and I think where that stems from, it, it may be political views, but it really is in America is innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And so there's all these accusations, but where's the actual evidence? And I know there's headlines saying that he was caught in lies and all of this. But again, we need to keep this conversation going. And if he did assault these women, let's get him into court and let's do something about it. Um, I don't know whether he did or didn't. I stay out of the political arena because I served 20 years in the military and although I'm retired, if we go to war, I could be called in, and he would be my commander-in-chief. Um, <laughs> so I, I kind of stay out of the political fray. However, there is something to be said, regardless of who's being accused, of innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think that it really falls in those camps. There are women who say, he did nothing, and why are you waiting so long? And there are women who are saying he shouldn't be president because he did. And we're really never going to know the truth. But um, it's important to just keep the dialogue going and believe those victims who come out and look at how we can change things. And when we have a presidential candidate or a candidate for Supreme Court or wherever, maybe we ought to do some better background checks. Maybe the FBI ought to do their work. How about starting with them? What happened there? Yeah. Hi, um, do you believe that a jury should decide whether a person is uh, guilty or not guilty? Yes. Uh, the jury system works, and, and in our country we have a choice between uh, bench trial, meaning by judge alone, or jury. Most people choose the jury, and it really is a system that works. I have also seen jury nullification. For example, juries will say, well, that's the, because I go and talk. I know this because for every jury that I have, I go back with the lawyers and with my students if they're there and with the detective, and we thank the jury and we talk to them and say, is there something we could have done better? The case is over now. We can tell you more about it that couldn't come into evidence. And they tell us why they made their decision. And sometimes the reason they made the decision is that's the life they chose. And what they've done is they've nullified the law. And in America, they're allowed to do that. 
But overall, juries are really smart, and they see and hear things that we don't um, because we know the case so well, the attorneys know the case so well, the juries are able to put together uh, things like incredible evidence and say we don't believe that, or to strengthen the evidence that they've heard because now they're putting together pieces that even the attorneys and detectives have overlooked. So the system works. Um, I have never really been dissatisfied with the jury. I don't like jury nullification, but that's our system. And overall, again, if that defendant is found not guilty and they are guilty, eventually we get them. Um, yeah, under, uh, I'll ask a question after because yeah. the perennial problem of the Maltese um, justice system, the delays, years of waiting for yeah. justice to be served. I mentioned two cases, um, murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia, the journalist who was blown up two years ago. We are still, the compilation of evidence only ended uh, just a few weeks ago. This is after they were arrested in December 2017. That's a long time. The case has not even started yet. Um, there was a case I asked you about for the interview about the Sunday Times. Uh, drug trafficker gets, uh, was arrested about 10 years ago um, outside the school. Um, he, in the meantime, until he was waiting for, for, for his hearing, um, eight, 10 years, you know, reformed. He went, uh, he, he's a family man, he's got a proper job and all that, and he was put into prison for three years. If you were appointed Chief Justice in Malta, how would you tackle these delays? First of all, for the drug dealer or drug user or drug pusher, whatever you have with the drug issues, if they have a huge period like that where he's done good, I would uh, not do anything except congratulate him. And I do have those cases where people abscond, they've gone for years, and then I look at their record and say, what have you done? And we, we check. In the United States, have they committed another crime? And sometimes it's not as much as a parking ticket. They've really turned their life around. So I simply dismiss the case, I stop probation and congratulate them. I think that's something that we need to applaud and not put in prison because now he goes backwards. On the other hand, there has to be some guidelines about how long a case takes. In America, if I put you in jail awaiting trial after 180 days, unless it's a very heinous crime, like a murder, um, I have to let you out of jail, and you go and live your life, and then we get to you as quick as we can. The top priority are getting those people who are incarcerated on, on who are incarcerated on hold. They go to the top of my trial list. But we try to handle every case within a year or two, and usually if it's two years, it's because they've been sent to the forensic center, and that takes about four months, or they've asked for additional um, DNA testing or a different uh, attorneys, but we try not to allow delays. And there has to be some rules about delays. And if things are delayed too long, cases have to be dismissed. Now, it shouldn't be a delay that is um, a lot of defense counsel, they like the delay. There has to be control on that because memories fade, evidence gets bad, it gets lost. And so we are doing a disservice to the victim, we're doing a disservice to everybody. So you have to move cases forward. Final question. So I want to pick on the point when you talked about Larry Nassar and not being, he's non redeemable he cannot rehabilitate himself. Um, so first of all, I, I, I want to say that I do not obviously sympathize with, with this guy. But um, uh, um, I want to ask you two questions about this thing. First of all, what are the, the signs, the human signs about someone? about Larry or about other people you, you, you've seen mm -hmm. that make you believe that they are um, non-redeemable. Uh, this, is, this, this is a grave thing to say, actually. You know, it's a final judgment on a human yes. being by another human being at, at the end. And the second thing is, is, is um, uh, what, what is your, what, how do you respond to, to people who, who, who want to who believe in, human, in the human power of, of changing themselves and who want to abolish the death sentence and in Malta, the life sentence. What is your reply to them? The death sentence in, in America, we are abolishing that um, because it's, it's cruel and inhumane and, and um, 
I don't believe in the death sentence necessarily, although we would save a lot of money. Um, <laughs> life sentences, though, for people like Larry Nasser are important because they can't be rehabilitated. Now you ask me, what are the signs? Well, first of all, when a defendant talks to me, and it's all about I this and I that, and never recognizes that he hurt someone, or she hurt someone, they can't say they're sorry. They don't acknowledge that what they did was a crime. They don't acknowledge that they hurt another human being. That's a real sign that they can't be rehabilitated because the first thing, at least I taught my children, I suspect you taught your children as well. You have to say you're sorry in order to move forward and really mean it and understand that you hurt someone so that you can do better. When you don't acknowledge you've done anything wrong, how can you be rehabilitated? Can you? I don't think so. And for people like Larry Nassar, it's really about... I'm sorry I got caught. Not, I'm willing to be rehabilitated. Now, I have a number of cases, and most of the people who are in front of me, we do rehabilitate. And let me just tell you a little story. I had a man who liked to pull out his penis in front of young women, and he went to all the coffee shops and dry cleaners in our town, and that is what he did. He was almost... Uh, he was mid-50s, I think, and he had been married about 25 years. His wife had stayed with him. This was not a rapist, but he had this fetish, and this is what he did. He did it multiple times, and he had a number of past offenses. And the prosecutor, in sentencing, said, he must go to prison for life. And the punishment on this particular crime, it's a very odd punishment, I can decide one day to life. It's not 20 years, it's not 30 years as a maximum. It's one day to life. And I thought to myself, here is a woman who stayed with a man with this problem. Here is a man who's not touching people, but he's just showing a body part. Now, we don't want to see that, and it's not right for him to do that, and it is a crime. But can we fix this? Do I throw this life away? So the research showed, and you can look it online, they did an article about it. The research showed that there's a birth control shot that stops that urge. So I said, are you willing to do this? And we had a hearing with a doctor who said, yes, this works. And I was willing to try it. And the people, the prosecutors said, no, we will appeal you. I said, go ahead. Here's my sentence. And my sentence was that he spent a year in jail, and he would every, I don't remember if it was every month or every three months, get this shot. And I didn't order him to get a shot. I am not a doctor. But I asked him if he was willing to take this, and he wanted to take it. And his doctor ordered it. So I ordered the jail to give him all medication that was prescribed. And they had to do it. And I ordered him to take all prescribed medication during five years of probation, which is the maximum I can give him. He just finished his five years. No more episodes. He has not had so much as a parking ticket. He's been law-abiding, and we have saved his life. Over the objection of the people who said, I'm going to appeal you, Judge. I don't care. I try to save a life when I can. And I listen. And I pay attention to what people say. And I listen to the defendant's family as well. And you have to look at the reasons sometimes people do things. I have defendants who shoplift. They steal. And there's a big difference to me, a mother or a father stealing because they want their child to have an Easter dress versus the college student who wants a third bathing suit where the parents said no. There are different punishments that I impose. So for the parent who is stealing because they don't have enough, I get them some help, some assistance, some retraining, job training, whatever it is. For the person who just was greedy, they get some training as well, but they also might get a taste of jail. Not a long taste, 
but enough to say this is not the path I want. So it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis, and I have to think about the deterrence of others, the safety of the public, the rehabilitation of the defendant. And I take that very seriously. Again, it's why I've listened to everybody for 15 years. Crime has no borders. So I listen to everyone, and I think that that is what all judges should do, and they're grumbling about it now because they say they can't do anything, but, and again, I don't care. It's your courtroom. Before we close, um, <clears throat> I believe there's the mayor of... One other question. One other question? Yes, very quickly. We were well over. My attorneys all over the world who say I, I'm doing the same thing. I have always used the, the line, what would you like me to know? When you say, what would you like me to know to someone, they feel that I'm willing to listen and to believe. And it's really important that you get rid of the word why. Why were you there? Why did you wear that short skirt? Why didn't you listen to me? You have to ask questions that reflect that you are open to listening and that you believe. <laughs> When you ask questions that shut down shame or blame, you simply are telling people, don't tell me, I don't care, and I don't believe you, and you don't matter. You should always ask a question that tells people that you matter. And so the way that I conducted not just that hearing, but all hearings, I, I have many, many victims. You heard 169 in that case, but there's, in many cases, several. They just don't make the media. Um, when they know that it's a safe place, that I'm listening, believing, and that I'm taking it all in, um, they're comfortable to speak. And it's always interesting to me because I hear, not just from the victims, but from defendants too, when I ask the defendant, because I try to figure out what went wrong in their life. And they tell me, and I will see the attorney step away and look at them. Why didn't you tell me? Why, why was the attorney not informed of what they're telling me? And sometimes the attorneys will say, may I approach? I say yes, and they say, you got to my client. I wasn't able to do that, and I've been meeting with him for a year. How did you do that? Thank you. And it's really about believing and listening and creating safe spaces, whether it's in your office, when you open your law office, or whether you are a parent, or whether uh, you're a judge. It's about having a safe place, listening and believing. Those girls felt that I listened and believed and they could finally tell their story because their parents didn't want to listen. Their teachers, many of the girls who spoke, they had never told their parents. Their parents learned what happened to them for the first time in my courtroom. We need to listen, believe, and to tell our children if they can't come to you, because I have to disclose, I did not tell everything that I did as a kid to my parents. Did you? Um, but I've always taught my children that if there's something that you don't want me to know, go to your Aunt Helen, go to your Uncle Joe or Uncle Tom. They are a safe place. They will always listen and help you. We need to let people know that there are safe places to tell whatever happened, and that they will be believed, and that they will be helped. And there just isn't enough of that in the world. But by creating the safe space, one came after the next, after the next. And they came and said, I am not a number, I am a name. Originally, only about six were going to use their name. Out of 156, only about six didn't use their name, and for good reason, because they were very young. But they empowered each other, and having that place to speak, that was safe, that where they were believed, that was the catalyst to all of this. And I, I credit them. Um, you have a question? Can I just ask you, given you know the high profile nature of your case and Michael Jackson's case and things like that, do you think that the conversation should change a bit around pedophilia as a problem rather than just it happens, you know, it happens across every culture, every society. Do you think that, not that victims should be made of pedophiles, but that they can go somewhere that maybe, you know, prevention better than cure? Yes, I think there should be places, there should be this discussion so that people who have this problem are comfortable saying, I have this problem, what can we do, where can I go, is there treatment? 
But the worst crime, I think, in, in the United States and across the world is that we're not dealing with mental health. Where's the mental health money? Where's the mental health facility? Where are the people who um, will come forward and say, I have an issue? Because they're not, they don't feel comfortable. They're shamed and blamed too. Parents don't want to say, my child is mentally ill because then they feel that they did something wrong. We have to stop the shame and blame. We have to be able to have these conversations, which is why all of this is so important, which is why I'm out there talking. Let's talk. We're all adults. Let's talk about penis and vagina and breasts. Let's teach our children. Let's talk about what pedophilia is. Let's talk about good feelings and bad feelings and where to go for help. And then maybe things will really change for the better. And that's what I'm hoping. That's where I want my children to be in a better, safer place where they can use their voice and be believed and we have change. And I hope that's what all of you want too. And I think you do because you're here. So thank you. And away from the shame and blame, uh, there's obviously <laughs> some people who are very proud of your Maltese connections. We've got uh, the Grand Mayor, uh, David Schember here, who would like to... We are peasants. Yes. <laughs> I have heard, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. Please permit me to just put in my, my few words. I am a local uh, politician, so this gives me a right to talk. <laughs> yeah. Before you, you see two people who have received life. Myself and my colleague, Carmen Valson, who have dedicated their life to our community, to Lendi. I too have an English mother uh, and a Maltese father. I too am from Lendi. So I can understand your passion. You made us extremely proud for saying you're Maltese, but you made us even prouder of saying that you are from Brandy. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I had the money to, to, to make a statue of you oh. as an inspiration, uh, as an inspiration to anyone else. Please permit me to present you with two publications. It's only right that during this book fair we present the publication. They are both written by a friend of ours who has written from his heart, Professor George Cassar and Sergio Greg. One is Randy and, it, and it's, its people and their inheritance. And the second one is in Maltese this time, Inti Mintamininti, who are you from? And this dedicates to, uh, is dedicated to the nicknames of the family. Uh, we are proud of you. We are proud of your father, Tachisri. Uh, so uh, you have made us really proud. Here we have not only an esteemed colleague, but also uh, a person who has dedicated 13 years for the uh, uh, benefit of our uh, locality. So it's only fair as the uh, present mayor to allow him just to say a few words himself. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I just want to tell you one thing. We, your, myself and your father, we were together. We were at school together. He is, I am actually about two years older than your father, but we, we are at school together all the time. If we my advice, tell him it's a Carmo da Bobo. <laughs> <laughs> Carmel Falzon is my name. Okay. But I am known as Carmel Tabu. We used to play together, go to everywhere together, you know. Anyway, all the best. Huh? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Please, before we go, you will have to uh, make a promise. Please never change. <laughs> I'm too old to change. <laughs> But I, I'm so very honored to be here today, and also um, I just want to tell you yeah, that much I've always I felt a part of Rendy. My, I don't know who knows my family, my, my grandparents, but my grandfather and his father, and my father also helped make the tapestry that is in the Rendy Church and Musta Church and Gozo Church that are put during the Feast of St. Mary. So my favorite time to come, if you want to see me, is in August when it's very hot, but I can see and touch part of my family. I will always have a connection here, always. 
and I am Maltese, living in America. Proud of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.